Well, let's get. Okay. Okay. <coughs> well, hello. Um, my name is Kevin Hopkins. I am uh, chair of Rich's uh, graduate committee. Uh, I'd like to start off just by introducing the committee. There's me, as I just said, I'm with the College of Agriculture and Forestry and Natural Resource Management at UH Hilo. Uh, Dr. Tim Grabowski from the Cooperative Fishery Unit, also based at UH Hilo, and Eva Schemmel from uh, the University of Hawaii Manoa. And I really want to greatly express my thanks to them for taking the time to be with us today and all for all the work they've done on, on the uh, this research work on what we have here. The uh, schedule of, for today will be first, I will give a brief introduction to Rich. Rich will then give his presentation. Please hold all your questions till the end of the presentation. Then we will have an open uh, uh, question and answer session with Rich. That will go on basically as long as we have good questions coming at us. And uh, after that, then the, uh, the open part of the, this meeting will close and it will just be the uh, committee chair, uh, the committee meeting with the rest of the members. Okay. So I'm very proud to be uh, having Rich Massey as one of my students. Uh, Rich originally got his aquaculture degree from the University of Rhode Island back in 1992. He is a non-traditional student in the sense that he got 1992 and then waited uh, over 20 years before coming back to school to get his master's degree. Uh, during that 20 years, he had a number of very interesting jobs, including running a, an ornamental fish farm in more than one location, working on other aquaculture operations, uh, working for one of the largest equipment manufacturers in the aquaculture industry. And he came to, to us here in UH Hilo in 2016 and has been working uh, here at UH Hilo at the Aquaculture Center since that time. Okay, and Rich is going to be Giving, talking about his thesis, characterizing the life history and recreational history of Nabetta in Hawaii. And Rich, I'm turning it over to you. All right, well, thank you. Um, thank you, good afternoon. Thank you to my committee and all of you for attending my thesis defense. Uh, my presentation is on characterizing the life history and recreational fishery of Nabetta and Istias Pavo in Hawaii. So this work is a culmination of over three years of work on my thesis. I had uh, did 18 sampling trips um, uh, with over 100 um, ototh extractions, preparations and readings and over 100 gonad harvesting and histology and readings. So, so I've been busy for a while, but I wanted to investigate Nabetta and the understudied recreational Nabetta fishery here in Hawaii. So my thesis is in two parts. First is the life history and reproductive pattern of Vinistius Pavo in Hawaii. And then the second part is characterizing the recreational Nabetta fishery in Hawaii using catch pictures from social media. Now, uh, both of these chapters were written as manuscripts for peer review publications, which I hope to submit by June of this year. Now, I just want to uh, first introduce you to Nabetta. There are five razorfish species found in Hawaiian waters. In Hawaiian, in Hawaiian it's Lenihi. In Japanese, it's Nabetta. They are in the Labridae family, and which are the wrasses. And there are two genus, the Xerichthys, which are prim primarily found in the Atlantic and Mediterranean, and then Anistius, which is primarily found in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, Nabetta is the Japanese term for Anistius pavo, or peacock razorfish, but locally, all razorfish species are referred to as nabetta. So here you can see the five species found in Hawaiian waters, the Anistius pavo, Anatensis, Baldwini, Celebicus, and Umbrelatus. But for the life history and reproductive patterns, I'm focusing uh, just on the Ipavo, which is the largest and most abundant of the five species. 
So the um, Ipavo range from the Indian Ocean to the west coast of the US. They inhabit sand patches adjacent to coral reefs, typically to a depth of 30 meters. They are called razorfish for their thin bodies and blunt forehead, which makes them easy to dive into the sand. The Rio razorfish are known for diving in the sand for protection. You can see an Ipavo poking its head out. And they can also swim for a meter or so in the sand and they sleep in the sand as well. They have a lek-like mating system. They're polygonous, which means there's a group of females will be within a male's territory and the male will mate with the females who are receptive. Now this is documented for similar species, but not for Ipavo. Ipavo are thought to be sequential hermaphrodites, but this is also not documented. They're protogenous, which means the juveniles first mature to females, then to a male, and this is common to the Labridae or the Rasses. Now, the Nebeta fishery is a recreational fishery, primarily for special events, graduations, weddings, and first birthdays. The relation, uh, they will occasionally be for sale in markets uh, at upwards of $15 per pound. Typically, they're fished for by angling from a boat or from shore or spear fishing. Now, there's very little information on the Nebeta fishery, the Nebeta population here in Hawaii. Since no recreational fishery license is required in Hawaii, there are no landing reports. This is from uh, the Hawaii Marine Recreational Fisher Fisheries Fishing Survey from 2013, a report from the Pacific Island Fishery Center. This is the only fishing data available and the follow-up studies were not performed. Most likely because the funds were just not available to go out and collect data, which is very time consuming and, and expensive. Big takeaway from this is from 2004 to 2011, there was a 90% decrease in the total catch. This decline is one of the reasons why I wanted to study the species. I conducted 18 fishing trips to collect samples. Also, fishers donated samples for my study. You can see that I collected all five species, but I Pava was caught the most. The right are sampling locations around the island of Hawaii, but I focused on areas near Hilo. So for the first part of the first chapter, I focused on the life history and reproductive patterns of Ipavo in Hawaii. So I started um, by looking at growth and aging. I collected samples to get the basic information, you know, lengths and weights, and extracted and examined otoliths to determine age. From this, I generated length and age frequencies, and then analyzed otoliths measuring the annuli to estimate length at previous ages. In doing this, I determine life history traits not previously documented. So next, I looked at the reproductive patterns of Ipavo. I harvested gonads from the collected samples. Then I examined the gonad history. I confirmed Ipavo are sequential hermaphrodites and demonstrated there are protogenous. Then I used this information to determine the length and age of the sex change. And finally, I looked at the spawning periodicity uh, they are thought to spawn year round. So just the basic life history information on my sample population. There were 36 male and 80 female samples. You can see that the males are larger than females and this suggests protogenous hermaphrodism. Now there's the L infinity, which is the theoretical largest length the species can achieve. And I'll get into this a little bit later. For Ipavo weights, again, you can see males are larger than females and males in the sample group average weights twice that of the females. Finally, looking at the age, they're relatively short-lived species living up to nine years, theoretically. And the largest Ipavo collected were only, I collected were only six years old. Females are younger than males. Again, this suggests protogenous hermaphrodism. Now, this data can be used to compare to other populations or re-examine these populations to determine if the fish if fishing is impacting growth and aging. Now, this is a model of the length weight relationship. The linear, mo the linear model is highly predictive of observed weight and length, and you, at weight and length of the samples, and you can see this in the R squared, which is 0 0.98. Again, males are larger than females. From the collected samples, I determined the frequency of males and females at length. Lengths and total length were gathered from samples and measured to the nearest millimeter. Now, analyzing the otoliths, I was able to determine ages of the samples. And the separation between males and females can be seen in both 
lengths, and ages. So I examined the sagittal otoliths of Ipavo. Now this is an example of an otolith. The actual length is 4.25 millimeters, so it's kind of small. Um, this one is an older male. The blue line shows the angle closest to the sulcus I used to measure the annuli. And the blue hash lines indicate where I identified the annuli. Now the results of the back calculations were from, are from measuring the distances from the annuli to the nucleus. Now, from the otolus, I was able to determine age at length and estimate lengths at previous ages. Now, this is a predictive model of both observed and back calculated estimates of length and age. The asymptomatic length, or L infinity, was 487 millimeters, though this is not indicated on the figure. The estimated weight for this asymptotic length was 2.9 kilos, and the age was over nine years. However, this is the theoretic, theoretical largest size and age of IPAVO based on my samples. The growth factor K was 0 0.158, which is pretty average for these species. Now, this model predicts well the lengths and ages, showing it's a good fit to the data and that I collected a decent range of lengths and ages. However, sampling is temporally limited to about one year. The next analysis was a look at the gonads to assess the reproductive phases. For the histological assessment, the gonads were embedded in paraffin, sectioned at five micrometers and counterstained with hematotoxylin and eosin at the John A. Burns School of Medicine at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I then developed a diagnostic criteria for determining the reproductive phases for IPAVO modified from the general criteria from Brown Peterson et al. 2011. I identified five female phases, one immature phase and four mature phases, and two male phases. Now, the next three slides are the developmental phases in the ovaries. This slide are the first two phases. First is the immature, females that have never spawned, primary, and you can see primary growth oocytes in the red circle. The next is developing, which is a mature female. The primary growth oocytes and secondary growth oocytes are present. Uh, in this phase, there are only the first two metallogenic stages, VT1 and VT2, that you can see in the red circles. Development of the early metallogenic oocytes are where lipids begin to form around the germinal vesicle. Now, there are other stages of oocyte development that may be present, like the cortical alveolar oocytes. You'll see blood vessels that are becoming prominent and atresia may be present, but I'm just highlighting the metallogenic stages. Now, these are the second two phases, the spawning capable, which is mature females getting ready to spawn. The third vitelogenic stage, VT3, is most prevalent, and you can see that in the circle. And then VT3, the lipids are formed around the germinal vesicle. Now, the next is actively spawning, where mature females <clears throat> are ready to spawn. Yolk granules fuse into liquid yolk, and lipid droplets coalesce. Germinal vesicles migrate to the pole, then they begin to break down. Then the oocytes hydrate, into a hydrate leading to ovulation. And you can see the hydrated oocytes in the circle, labeled HY. The last slide is an inactive phase broken down to two subphases. Regressing, which is the mature females post-spawning. You can see some primary growth and secondary growth oocytes and, and artesia, which is in the circle. And that's the breakdown of the oocyte components. And there's many stages. In the regenerating, a mature female is in the, is in the inactive phase. Um, so primary oocytes are present. You see a bit of late stage atresia and a thick ovarian wall, which is OW in the picture and a large space in the lumen. So that's the progression of oocyte development in the ovaries. Now the next is the male gonads. Histologically, there are many phases, but they're very difficult to determine. So I focused on the stages that I could identify from these samples. In sequential hermaphrodites, you typically see sex changing in the gonads. So you'll see small sperm packets in along, along with oocytes in the ovaries, or primary growth oocytes with different stages of sperm development in the testes. However, none of the samples I collected exhibited this. Now, this could be due to the sample size and or the rapid transition from female to male. Now, true traditional Transitional phages are easily seen in temperate species, but not well documented in this species. So on the left is the male with the MMC or the melanoma macrophage centers. This is where the gonads break down the tissues, otherwise the garbage cans. And there's also the presence of sperm. 
In these samples, their presence, the presence of the melanomacrophage centers is suggestive of the sex change given the now, the, the next slide the next, of the right is the actively spawning male, and you see the presence of spermatids and spermatozoa, and in the circle, sperm is in the sperm sinus ready for spawning. Now, nope, putting this all together, a histogram based on the histological analysis of the reproductive phases of the samples. Brown colors indicate females. Now, there's one immature female, an outlier, but this was difficult to assess if it was an immature or regenerating. The blues are the males. The males with the MMC are before the act actively spawning uh, males. However, there is one outlier, I guess it was our early developing individual. Uh, the sex ratio was 2.2 to one females to male. The total length of the males is 6.1 centimeters greater than the females. And the smallest observable male is 21.1 centimeters. So next, I want to know the length and age at sex change. This is defined when greater than 50% of the population are males. The gray area represents 95% confidence intervals. And the dots represent observed cum cumulative frequency of males. This and the next slides are logistic progressions of sex change at length and age. This model shows the length at sex change when greater than 50% of the individuals are male. This is indicated by the blue lines, and that's the L delta 50, which is at 257 millimeters. Now, this means if you were to catch an, an IPOBO greater than 26 centimeters in my study area, it has greater than a 50 chance, 50% 50 chance of being a male. Next is the age at sex change. This you would have to see from the analysis of the otoliths. For age, the model shows the age at sex change when greater than 50% of the individuals are male. Now this is indicated by the blue line to so the A delta 50, which is 4.44 years. Now I only have a few samples that are age six, so they're a bit outside of the model, but Anyway, this information is, an important, is important as changes in the L delta 50 and the A delta 50 could indicate impacts from fishing, from environmental changes, or adaptation of the population. However, again, this is a snapshot of my samples, but this information can be used to compare to IPAVO and other locations in Hawaii or in their range. Now, this is a table, a number of reproductive phases caught in each month based on the samples I collected or were donated. I was not able to fish in all months due to weather and in the winter and boat availability in the summer. Now, IPAV are thought to spawn year round, but the most I conclude, can conclude from this data is that they have a protracted spawning period. So, I was able to document life history, the life history of IPAV in the sampling area. I confirmed sequential protogenous hermaphrodism in IPAVO, and I determined the length and age at sex change. Could not confirm year-long spawning, but I can suggest a protracted spawning period. Now, this information is foundational so that the future comparisons can be made to this sample area to determine if fishing has impacted the population. Okay, next part <clears throat> is chapter two. This was characterizing the recreational fishery, the Nevada fishery in Hawaii using catch pictures from social media. In researching Nevada, I found there was almost no documented information on the Nevada fishery in Hawaii, only that there was the 90% decline in the total catch from 2004 to 2011, and that's it. However, I did find that there was a large amount of information from catch pictures on Instagram. So I wanted to develop a framework for comparing data from social media find out what data could be extracted consistently and what inferences could be made from the data. So first I researched if data mining social media is a valid way to collect fishery information. Found several documented examples. First one was done in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean looking at YouTube to find catch seasonality from season spearfishers posts. They found that the videos posted by spearfishers compared well to underwater visual counts. They determined species accumulation curves from the two sampling methods provided comparable estimates of species richness for any sample size. So data mining social media is, a, is comparable to underwater visual counts. Another study used data mining YouTube and other social media outlets to track catfish invasion pathways, the Guadina drainage basin in Portugal. What they found is the present study reinforces the usefulness and relevance of using validated online social media fishermen records, provides a more complete and updated distribution range of non-native fishes, 
and enabled the assessment of their dispersal patterns. Now, this is a particular importance because it allows near real-time monitoring of non-native fish dispersal, including first occurrence of non-native fish at a minimal cost, which is really important. And finally, in East Africa, a study showed that data from trophy catch pictures were comparable to official surveys. Okay, so I hypothesized that data mining catch pictures from Instagram could be used as a valid source of information on the meta fishery in Hawaii. Next, I had to devise methods for gathering data from the catch pictures posted on Instagram. Then I had to come up with a framework to assess if the methods were a valid way to collect information, to collect data on the Nebeta fishery. To do this, I examined catch pictures on Instagram using hashtag Nebeta. I selected 177 kick catch pictures from the over 2100 hashtag Nebeta posts. Now a lot of the other posts were of a rock band or a drift car, so obviously I didn't use those. But first, I developed criteria for using posted catch pictures. First, it had to have at least one Nebeta. Next, it had to show all of the catch and no fish could be displayed on a cooking service. That's just so they didn't just select the best ones or the ones they wanted to cook. From the selected 177 posts, I counted all the Nebeta and non nebeta species. Now, in this part of the study, references to Nebeta are to all five of the Anistia species found in Hawaii. From this data, I determined the number and species of fish caught, the types of catch pictures, associations of what Nebeta species were caught together, and the fishing methods from a boat, shore fishing, or spear fishing, and the seasonal patterns. The assumptions are that the posts were from a single day's catch and posted within 24 hours of the catch. Now, this was confirmed to be correct by an experienced fisher with an online social media channel. Now, these are a few examples of the hashtag Nebeta catch pictures from Instagram that I examined. Now, since posting on social media, the catch pictures are publicly available and I did not have to contact individual posters for their permissions to use their catch pictures. There's a lot of information on this slide, but I wanted to exemplify that there's a lot of information in the catch pictures. Now, Instagram's relatively new, started in 2012. Now, I looked at other social media outlets like Facebook and YouTube. They mostly talked about the fishing or fishing experience of, for catching Nebeta or how they cook Nebeta, so I focused on Instagram. Hashtag Nebeta post started in 2012, and I reviewed the posts from 2012 to 2021 and I stopped collecting data and began analysis. However, I recently scanned hashtag Nebeta posts for 2021, and there are 20 posts. So from 2015 on, there are basically a consistent amount of ne hashtag Nebeta posts. Now, looking at all the catch pictures posted on Instagram, I identified eight picture types. I'll show examples a little later, but what I found was that there are three factors and two levels that made up the picture types. First is how the catch is displayed organized, which is an effort was put into showing off their catch, or random is a haphazard display. Second is what type of surface the catch was arranged on. A flat surface on the ground, the deck of a boat, what have you, or cooler, which means they were in a cooler. Finally, there's pers perspective that the fish was photographed. Perpendicular, essentially taken overhead of the catch, or angle, which is at an angle generally 45 degrees or less. So from the breakdown of the picture types, fishers generally organized their catch and took pictures from above. So they are proud of showing off their efforts, which really made identifying numbers easy, numbers and species easier. Now, Instagram posts are dated. So I put together the posts across the months of the years of the study. You can see that catch pictures were posted in every month. However, there were dips in the winter, February, and summer, July, much like I experienced. There's a lot of information here, but I want to draw your attention to the IPAVO broken out below. IPAVO were identified in the most posts, 156, which made up 88.1% of the catch pictures. They were also caught in significantly higher numbers of single catch posts, meaning they were the only Nebeta species caught. However, from the posts, it's difficult to determine if IPAVO was targeted. Nebeta patches are typically a closely guarded secret with fishers, but since all Anistia species are referred to as Nebeta. They may just be going after the big ones and not know the species. Now, see if I could identify any trends in the association from the catches. I put all the catch data into a principal component analysis or PCA. 
It's a multi-dimensional representation of Nebeta associations simplified to a two-dimensional biplot. It visualizes information so you, that you wouldn't get to see in a spreadsheet. A PCA is a model generated from all the data and is used merely to identify associations. It does so by creating new uncorrelated variables and that successively maximize variance. Variables of interest for the species are represented by eigenvectors or arrows with the magnitude and direction. Since PCAs don't generate statistics, I don't wanna to spend too much time with this, but it does illustrate some important information. Now the nebeta are identified with the first four letters of the species. The biplot is generated from the two most important PC loadings. Now together, they represent 48.2% of the variance in the data, which is pretty good. But first, I wanna highlight the number of species present in the catch pictures. The colored shapes indicate the number of species identified in the catch pictures. And as you can see from the purple circles, Ipavo is most often caught in a single species. Celebicus is as well, but they're only represented from a small number of posts. Now there's a few associations, but highlighting them all will get confusing, so I'll identify two. First is that Ipavo is negatively associated with Celebicus, and you can see that with the red line. As this is in multidimensional space, but represented in two dimension, these eigenvectors are at a 90 degree angle. The second association, the Anatensis Baldwin and I number latest grouping is in the yellow circle. From the Instagram post, you can see that this species the species in this group are strongly associated with each other, suggesting that they are likely to inhabit the same sand patch. You can also see that Ipavo and Isolibicus are unassociated with Anatensis Baldwini and Umbrelatus, meaning that they tend not to be associated with this grouping. An important finding from this PCA is that Ipavo are most often caught in, a sing in single species catches. So what I learned from data mining Instagram pictures. Picture types, there are better ways to display the catch for gathering information. Organized proved to be the best. This is good because fishers tend to be proud of their catch and naturally they organize catch for display. But the fishing methods in, in the post and Instagram users indicate that they are angling from a boat or a kayak or from shore or spear fishing. And angling from a boat was the most prominent. So if a fishery manager wants to collect data, intercepting fishers coming into the boat ramp is the best location. For season, the better are typically caught year round with dips in the winter, but most likely due to the weather and summer, presumably because their, their attention is elsewhere. Numbers, a are the most often caught in a better species and should be the focus of future studies. Associations, the Anatensis Baldwini Umbrelatus group most often occur in the same sand patch. See, and none of this information has been previously documented. So I developed the methods to organize and interpolate catch pictures and demonstrated data mining Instagram pictures and show trends in the industry. But how good is the information gathered from catch pictures? So I created a way to analyze these methods, which helped the volunteer with the help of volunteers to read stage catch pictures. I focused on reader errors and demonstrated the validity, the validity of these methods. And I evaluated the experience necessary to extract high quality data from the catch pictures. The idea was to validate the methods for reading catch pictures so that other researchers could use this technique to analyze catch pictures for their fishery. So I wanted to find out if independent readers interpolate the data from staged catch pictures where the actual catch is known. So I staged catch pictures like that seen on Instagram to assess the validity of using this method. I enlisted volunteer readers of varying experience levels in identifying Hawaiian reef species. So each reader was given it was emailed a folder with an information sheet showing the morphological differences of each species, a brief tutorial on how to read the stage catch pictures, and a PowerPoint presentation with 40 slides of the stage catch pictures, five each representing the eight picture different picture types. For this part of the study, I only used the five Nebeta species in the catch pictures. And I asked readers to identify the Nebeta in the pictures. I then examined the errors in identifying the number of fishes, and the species in the pictures. What I found was that the analysis of the reader's errors suggest that this method is a valid source of accurate and repeatable data. So first, 
I used the Nebetta I caught or were donated to stage five each of eight picture types for volunteers to read, simulating the display surface and perspectives similar to the Instagram catch pictures. 17 volunteers of different experience levels assisted me for this part. The novice had no knowledge of Hawaiian reef species and no Nebetta fishing experience. The intermediate had a little knowledge of Hawaiian reef species, maybe had some done Nebetta fishing. The fishers or experts had a lot of experience in Hawaiian reef species, identifying Hawaiian reef species, and have fished for Nebetta. Now the readers were given 40 identical pictures to identify, and the, finish, the fish is in the picture using species color-coded dots, and you can see that in the picture, with an additional unknown category or dot to identify a Nebetta not to the species level. I then compared readers' output to the known values, which, I know because I set up the stage catch pictures. Okay, now these are the examples of the eight types of catch pictures that I staged. 176 Nebetta were randomly selected from the fishes caught for this study for a total of 620 observations. The readers were each presented with 40 slides in a random order. Now the next slides, a series of slides will show you the three different factors and two levels of the catch picture types. First slide shows the factor of display. These are the catch displayed in organized fashion. These are catch displayed in a random or ha haphazard fashion. The next two slides are what surface the catch was displayed on. The catch, the, these are the catch on a flat surface. Now this could be on the ground, on the deck of a boat, on the top of a cooler, on a table, or any flat surface. These are the catch in the cooler displayed organized or randomly. The last two slides are the perspective of the photograph of the catch picture. These were photographed from approximately directly above or perpendicular to the catch. Finally, these were photographed at an angle. I approximated an angle of 45 degrees or left for these pictures. Now the reader results. First, in the, first is the total number of observations of individual fish that were recorded, the readers recorded. Of the 620 individual fish or observations, you can see that the readers were able to identify almost all of the fish in the catch pictures. Novice and intermediate readers on average identified 98% of the fish, while the fishers were able to identify just about all the fish. And even one reader was perfect, identifying all the fish and the species as well. Now this shows that even inexperienced readers can identify most all the fish in the catch pictures. Let's see now. now, reader results. Next are the unknown, uh, yeah, next are the unknown observations, there we go. Um, this is where a reader could identify individual fish as nebetta, but could not identify it to the species level. Novice and intermediate readers were unsure of the most uh, observations between 6.2 and 3.3% respectively, while fishers were able to identify the species to all but 1.4% of the individuals. Overall, this demonstrates readers can identify species to a very high percentage of the fish in the catch pictures. One thing to note, obs these observations are for Nebetta. I could have calculated observation errors based on picture type and such, but that would be very specific to Nebetta. Researchers using these methods would have different species, so an analysis to that level would not be applicable to their region. Okay, now this is a logistic regression of the reader results. But first, what I wanted to find out was how the reader reader's errors impacted the accuracy of reading the catch pictures. This figure shows the probability of a reader making an error with increasing amounts of fishes in the catch picture. An error was an error in misidentification of a species or an error not identifying a fish in the catch picture. The solid lines indicate the probability of readers making an error in observations with fishes displayed in an organized fashion, while the dotted lines show the, the fish is displayed randomly. The different colors represent the probability of readers of different experience levels making an error in observations. The model shows that there was not a significant difference between the novice and intermediate levels of experience. However, there was a significant difference between the novice and intermediate group and fishers. The probability of a novice and 
and intermediate making either type of an error was at 4.2%. The probability of a fissure making in either type of error was only 0.3%. Now, the percentage of errors in observations is based on the probability of the readers making an error exclusive of the factors of display, the solid lines, solid or dotted lines, and the number of fish. So what you're looking at is the y-intercept. Now, when the factors of display and number of fish in the picture were accounted for, the probability of the reader making an error increased. Now, this is the important part. This illustrates that readers, specifically fishers or experts, can generate accurate and repeatable results from the pictures. So researchers can use this technique to gather reliable data using catch pictures for their region. Now, the last thing I want to show you is the PCA for reader errors. As with the previous PCA, the Nebeda uh, are identified with the first four letters of their species. The total of PC1 and PC2 is 70.5% of the variance of the data, which is very good. Now in this PCA, the colored shapes represent reader errors. The colored ellipses represent a 95% confidence in interval for the different reader levels. Now you can see that the ellipses show similar trends in errors across all reader levels. This means that the errors were similar, just proportionally less for the most experienced readers. Now, I also want to share the species association. They are the same as in the Instagram biplot, but in this case, they are not a species associations, but errors of identification of species or not identifying a species in the catch picture. So in this case, it shows Anatensis, Baldwini, and Umbrellatus group are misidentified as each other. And Pavo and Salubricus are not misidentified as the Anatensis, Baldwini, and Umbrellatus group. Overall, this suggests that with some training, Readers can produce accurate information from catch pictures. So researching, inner, researching the existing literature showed data mining social media can be used to collect accurate and repeatable information. I developed methods for, for using catch pictures. I assessed, the, the, I generated information on the Nebeda fishery otherwise unknown. I assessed the accuracy and repeatability of analyzing data from catch pictures. And finally, I demonstrated that catch pictures are a valid source of information. Now, this method is a cost-effective method for gathering data on an understudied recreational fishery. So instead of going to the time and expense of having researchers interview and collect data using traditional methods of creole or phone surveys, catch pictures can be used to more efficiently collect data. So how do you use this? Well, you can data mine catch pictures that already exist, if there's, if there's catch pictures for your region, or kind of thinking outside of the box, a researcher in a region could generate a competition, say, where fishers post their catch pictures and possibly win a monthly prize or you know, such as fishing gear or a gift certificate or something. Now, if you do this, if it's done over several years, it could be an inexpensive and an effective way to collect data on the fishery in a region. You can also use uh, collect uh, catch pictures during fishing tournaments. And when the, the competitors are bringing in their catches, they have to include a catch picture. So over the course of time, we'll be able to collect information. So there's a number of different ways to use existing information or a way to generate information um, with, new, with new pictures coming in. So did I achieve my goals? What I presented here is the documentation of the life history and reproductive patterns for IPAVO in Hawaii that had not been done before. This information can be used not only in Hawaii, but for species throughout the range and as a baseline for studies in other areas and for temporal comparisons in this study area. Additionally, I demonstrated how catch pictures can be used to identify trends in the Nibeta fishery that were otherwise unknown. And finally, I have documented that using catch pictures is an accurate, repeatable, and cost-effective way to gather data on a recreational fishery. So I'm hoping that this method can be used by researchers in understudied recreational fisheries that don't have the resources to do expensive and time-consuming surveys so they can effectively gather usable and consistent data. So I just wanna say thank you to my committee, Dr. Kevin Hopkins, who's the chair, Dr. Tim Grabowski, Dr. E Eva Schemmel, 
I'd also like to thank the Hawaii Property Fisheries Unit for their lab space, the Gonad Histology and Supplies, Forrest Peterson for donating his boat and fishing experience, Ricky Tabandera for his fishing experience and expertise and statistical report, and all the fishers who donated fish for the project. And all the readers who donated their time to help me with the assessment and the validation process. All research was conducted under IACUC protocol 1932-12. And thank you to all who uh, were attending my thesis defense.